Hello. All right. I like to walk. Um, no, thank you. It's a huge honor to be here today. Uh, I've never been to Singapore before, so this is my, my first chance to visit. Um, my wife and I are planning on sticking around this weekend and, and exploring a little bit. So we would love any, uh, any recommendations. Uh, so I'm a developer at GitHub. I work on Ruby, JavaScript, uh, and kind of whatever else needs done to, to work on product features. Uh, most recently, I finished a project kind of uh, revamping GitHub wikis a little bit. I don't know if you've used them recently. They've gotten a, a bit better. Um, and then right now, the project that I'm working on is actually uh, upgrading us from Rails 2.3 to 3, which is like five years late. <laughs> so, but we're close. We're close. We'll be on, we'll be on, Git on Rails 3 soon, uh, and then 3.1, 3.2, and 4 before too long. So. Anyway, that's what I've been working on. Um, you can find me online as beekeepers, both on, on Twitter and GitHub. Uh, I'm not a garden gnome, despite what that suggests. But uh, if you have any questions throughout this or want to get in touch, feel, feel free to tweet at me. We'll probably have some time for, for questions at the end. But if we don't get to them, I, I promise I will reply on Twitter. So about seven years ago, uh, my wife and I bought a house, and we planted our first vegetable garden. Uh, it was in our backyard. It was small, not very ambitious. We had no idea what we were doing, uh, but we kind of wanted to experiment with it. Uh, each year, we've kind of continued to do this and continued to expand. This is actually the, a picture from like the second or third year that we did it. We built some nice boxes, um, started kind of scaling things up. And, and over the years, I've realized that what I like about software development, what I like about the software development process is not the engineering side. I'm actually not a very good engineer. Um, but I really like the gardening side. Uh, see, software really isn't like this like predefined, prefabricated product that like goes through this like nice clean process and comes out at the end. It's really more of an organic process. Like you, your job is to, to create the right conditions for this thing to thrive, and then as it grows, make small adjustments and try and shape it into um, something that eventually, hopefully, produces fruit. Uh, and, and ideally with that fruit, then, you, you have seeds that you can then go on and, and plant in other products and use them in other ways. And so uh, I've been thinking a lot about this the last year or so. Um, and, and specifically with, as it relates to open source, because, I mean, gardening alone is awesome. You get, you get all of these things. You get you know, nice fruit that you get to eat yourself. Um, but it's even better if you can share it with other people, uh, especially if you can share the harvest. So at GitHub, over the years, we've, we've actually done quite a bit of open source. Um, and I would say, if we're honest about it, lately we haven't been that good at it. Um, you know, we're still on Rails 2.3 which means that we can't participate in um, making Rails itself better. We have some projects that we haven't, haven't been the best caretakers of. So at the beginning of this year, I kind of made it one of my personal goals. This is something we need to get better at. This is something I want to do better at myself, uh, and this is something I want GitHub to be better at. So I, I've kind of set out on this journey this last year. Um, and I want to talk today about some of the lessons that my love for gardening has been teaching me about maintaining open source. Um, and so today we'll kind of walk through the process of gardening um, as that relates to maintaining an open source project. And kind of ultimately my goal is to convince all of you uh, to go out and start your own gardens, um, to go out and release open source and learn what this process looks like. So before I do, um, before we dive into to this process, I want to talk a little bit about my experience. Um, my first open source contribution was in 2006. Uh, it was shortly after I had started using Ruby and Rails. Um, and recently, I, well, over the years, I, I've contributed to whatever projects, gems, and stuff that I was using, but I've never really been involved in a large open source project. I've, I've submitted some patches to Rails here and there, but never um, you know, been extremely involved. Recently, my probably what most well-known project is .env. It's just a really simple um, thing that will load up configuration files into the environment when your app bootstraps. It's not very complicated. Uh, in the past, I was the maintainer of Delayed Job for a long time. Uh, I didn't originally write it. It was written by Tobias Lutke from Shopify. Um, but at the point at which we went from Rails 1 to 2, when 2 started supporting gems, he didn't really have any interest in maintaining it, so I gemified it and then supported it for several years. Uh, after that, I worked on a project that 
probably nobody's ever heard of called Q, which is kind of an abstraction of, of these database Q idea where you can swap out backends. Uh, my first gem ever was called Tinder. It was a Campfire API. Before Campfire actually had an API, it would just do screen scraping. Um, my only uh, non-Ruby project that I've kind of actively worked on is called Rosie. It's basically factory girl for JavaScript. And then recently, my kind of uh, pet project has been this GitHub notifications client, um, because I hate email and get a lot of GitHub notifications, and I'm trying to figure out a better way to manage them. So this is where I'm coming from. I mean, none of these projects, as you can see, are huge. Uh, none of these are Rails. You know, they're not, it's not Ruby. Um, these are all really small projects, actually. Um, and so I would say, you know, if I had to judge myself as an open source contributor, I would say I'm average. I'm not prolific, I'm not a beginner, I'm somewhere kind of in, in the middle. Um, and I say that basically to convince you that this is something that all of you can do. Uh, so we talked about large open source projects. I would actually argue that something like Rails is actually more like farming. It's not gardening. Um, it's at a much bigger scale than that. Uh, or, you know, certain projects might be a little bit more like land management, where you're just trying to make sure that things don't fall apart and burn down, um, but you don't necessarily have control over the process. So specifically today, I'm talking about gardening. I'm talking about these smaller projects um, that we all use in, in and out on, on our apps uh, every day. Uh, so before we dive into this a little bit more, I do need to give some, some credit to Steve Klabnik. Uh, he, had, he posted this great article um, how to be an open source gardener. I would highly recommend you go read it. Uh, his, was, his was at the perspective, though, of diving into one of these really large apps. Um, you know, he, he got involved in Rails, started um, kind of tending kind of some of the issues. Uh, and, and so anyway, it, it's a great perspective. I would definitely recommend reading it. Um, but I want to clarify that this is not actually the perspective that I'm coming from. I'm talking about smaller gardens than this. So before we dive into this, uh, I just kind of want to get an idea of where you're all at. Show of hands, how many people right now maintain an open source project? Like you are the maintainer or one of them. All right, excellent. Keep your hands up. How many people have committed, contributed in some form to an open source project? Even more, all right, excellent, thank you. So before you dive into any gardening project, you need somewhat of a plan. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, but a plan will at least help you kind of avoid some common mistakes. And when you start that out, I think the important question to ask is, why am I doing this? What are my motivations? I think there's some myths about open source and what it will gain you. Um, you know, some people think, oh, if I just put this out, somebody else will write the code for me. Somebody else will do the work. Um, and if, you, if any of you that have maintained open source uh, have experienced this, you know that that's not usually the case. Most small projects hardly ever see a real contribution. Um, but ultimately, I mean, our goal has to be to produce fruit, right? We want to make our projects better. We want to uh, create things that other people can use. We're all driven by this desire to create things. Um, but I think there, there has to be something else that sustains us, and that, and that is this, this ultimate goal to produce a better product. The second question we need to ask ourselves when we're, we're getting involved in open source is how much time can you dedicate to this? Uh, because it takes a lot more time than you think it should. And the weird thing about it is, uh, so there's large, large open source projects seem to be the ones that you would expect to take up more time, and they do take a lot of time. Um, and they're hard because so many people care about them, but open, smaller projects are kind of the opposite. They're hard because nobody cares about them. Um, you're the only one, and so you have to spend all of your time tending it. So that's, a, that's the planning phase. Just ask yourself some simple questions. Now we're ready to actually dig in and start doing some of the work. Uh, when you're ready to release it, there, there are a few things that we can do to create the right conditions for this project to flourish. Um, and in, in gardening, we call this cultivation. You're preparing the dirt, you're fertilizing it so that the, the project can actually take root. Uh, so for an open source project, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to contribute and use your project. Any small barrier to that, any small hurdle, could be enough to discourage somebody from actually contributing. So let's talk about what some of those things are. Uh, the first one seems obvious or silly, uh, but pick a good name. 
uh, the name of your project can actually make or break it. Uh, and so what makes a good name? Uh, this is not a complete list, but these are kind of the things that I've been, um, that will run through my head as I'm getting ready to release something. First, it has to be searchable. If it's really generic, it's hard for people to find it. It needs to be memorable. Um, so those two are kind of at odds. If you want something to be searchable, you need it to be unique, but you also don't want it to be so unique that nobody can remember what it is. And then you need it to be suggestive. Like what, it needs to suggest somewhat of what this project actually does. It can't be completely unrelated. And then on the, the not side, uh, it can't be too boring, or again, it'll be hard to find, people won't care about it. It can't be too weird, it'll be hard to, it'll be hard to remember. Um, and also not too trendy. Like if anyone wrote a Rails plugin back in the day, there was the axe as whatever trend, and now nobody writes plugins named axe as whatever. So be careful that your name will actually last for a while. So as an example of this, I, I mentioned my, my project called Q. Um, I think in terms of, of the, the quality of code, it's probably one of the projects I'm most proud of, but nobody's ever heard of it. Nobody's ever used it because they can't find it. Um, it's really hard to search for, and people can't even really pronounce it. They're like, Q, U, Q, 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 huh? Um, so when I, when I was showing this to a friend initially, uh, I was trying to explain it to him, and I'm like, you know, it's, it's just, oh my gosh, it's a better background cue. That's all it is. And so I came up with this idea, like, oh, I should have called it OMG BBQ. <laughs> so I'm going to rename it. I, I claimed that name on Ruby Gems recently so that nobody else could steal it. Um, but we'll, we'll get ready for the marketing push soon. But I think this is a good example of a name. Like, it's kind of fun, it's playful, it's not too weird because we all know what it means, at least somewhat depending on, on cultural barriers. Um, but th I think this is a good example. The next thing we need to do is write documentation. TJ talked about this a little bit ago. If you want people to use your code, or if you want your project to thrive, you need people to use your code. And if you want them to use it, they have to be able to figure out how. Um, and that's docs. So docs are not as fun, they're not as sexy, they're, you know, it's not as interesting as actually writing the project, but it's still extremely important. Uh, and a little bit of documentation can go a long way. So probably the most important part is the readme. At least if you're putting your project on GitHub, this is the thing that takes center stage. And so I want to talk briefly about what makes a good readme, because um, I think that this is probably the most important part of your documentation. So first we have a one-line description. Uh, this is just a project that was on uh, the GitHub trending page recently. So I, I completely picked it at random, um, simply that it was like the second thing on there. So you have to have a quick one-line description. Tell people what the heck this thing does and why they should care. Um, it should be clear, it should be concise, it should have some of the key words that people are looking for, um, but not so long that they get bored while they're reading it. That's what the second line's for, a little bit longer explanation. Um, this project chose to just do a sentence or two. Some of my projects I've done like a couple paragraphs to explain the motivation behind it or why it's different than, than some existing thing that's out there. Um, after that, we need to tell people how to actually install it. Again, this depends on the project. If it's a Ruby gem, just say gem install the gem name or add this to your, your gem file. Um, if it's something else, so this is a JavaScript library, they say, hey, just include this in, your, in the header of your page. But showing people how to install it is, is an important next step. We need to then tell people how to use it. Uh, and this should probably be the longest section in your readme. It should kind of outline all of the, the different options, um, you know, give an overview of, of the way, different ways that people can actually use the project. And then finally, all the way down at the bottom, you tell people how to contribute. Because the, the goal is that, you know, the first time somebody comes to your project, they're gonna start at the top of that readme. But over time, they're gonna, they're gonna work their way down, right? Eventually they'll install it, eventually they'll use it. And the only way that your project is gonna thrive then is if you can help them become a contributor. So at the bottom, include that information. How do I get the source code? How do I run the tests? Um, how should I submit a pull request? Do you want pull requests or would you rather, you know, me email you a patch? I don't, do people still do that? I don't know, maybe not. But tell people how to contribute. Um, if you want some examples of good readmes, I said I went to the, the trending page. Uh, I would recommend starting there. I've found that most of the projects that show up there 
are, are there because they've done this one thing well. They've, they've documented their, way, their code in a way that, that has engaged people. So look at those examples. Uh, next, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is something I don't care a lot about, but it is important. You have to choose a license. Uh, if you don't have a license on your project, then the assumption is that it is copyrighted by you and nobody else has permission to use it. Um, but there's also like weird legality things there that I don't understand. Um, but I'll basically just choose a license. Um, if you need help with that, choosealicense.com is a pretty helpful site that will kind of walk you through the like couple basic ones. So start there. And then lastly, for, for preparing your projects, you need to just simply follow conventions of other projects. If you want people to contribute, then they need, it's helpful if you can have them do it in a way that they're already familiar with. Um, so if, if it's a Ruby app, follow Ruby conventions. If, you know, have an app directory, if it's Rails, have a lib directory, if it's a gem. Um, have your tests mirror your app um, or your, your lib files which seems kind of silly, but then it, it is actually really helpful. People can easily dive in. Um, you know, have a gem file, have a rake file. Whatever it is, those conventions are there for a reason. Um, but mostly, it's, it's easier for people to dive in. But if you're going to make changes to your project, now's the time to do it, because nobody has seen it yet. So the next step in tending this open source garden is we need, now need to sow it. Uh, and I think that this is probably what we imagine, uh, as we imagine kind of this glorious open source life, we imagine that this is the main part of it, right? Uh, but this is actually the easiest part. This is simply taking everything that you've already done and just putting it out there. Uh, there's not a lot of work involved in this. The only, the only work required at this step is that now you have to talk about what you just did. And I know for many of us, that's hard. We're not very good at advertising the things that we do. Um, but you need, to, you need to advertise it. Say, hey, I created this thing. Here's why it's important. Here's why it's good. Here's why I think you should use it. Uh, I found it helpful to blog about it. Um, so I just have blogopensoul.org. Uh, so here was my blog post about .env when I released it. And it was just a, you know, a couple paragraphs, as you can see. Here's why I did it. Uh, here's why I think it's important. It doesn't have to be slimy. It doesn't have to be uh, you know, deceptive, uh, as long as it's coming out of a place that's, that's genuine, um, people really appreciate it. Uh, and then, after you've blogged about it, put it on social media. Um, I know that this seems like a silly game of trying to, like, get your thing on the top of Hacker News or whatever, but I think it actually makes a huge difference. So, so tweet about it. You know, some projects, if they make sense, have a Twitter account um, that helps people follow it. But, but talk about it. So everything we've done up to this point is really the fun and easy part. We created the project, uh, we got it ready, uh, we released it, and now is when the work actually begins. Uh, and this is the part that I think most of us don't think about when we're thinking about open source. Everything that wants to grow needs watered, um, and it needs it consistently. So without water, plants in the garden will go dormant um, in an attempt to survive drought the leaves will curl up, uh, and they'll eventually die if you don't water them. So our projects are the same way. We need to consistently water them. Um, and consistency is, is the important part. Uh, in gardening, they, they, they recommend that you, you water your plants every morning. Uh, in the morning, before it gets too hot, um, this gives the plants time to draw up the water uh, before the heat of the day. Uh, but if you do it at night, there's a chance that there could be like disease. Anyway, but I found that this is actually really helpful advice for open source. That if you uh, try and form a habit of, of not maybe not every day, but most mornings, just wake up, check in on your project. Has there been any issues? Has there been any conversations? Try and keep moving the, the ball forward on, on several of those things. Part of that is then also setting a guide for what it looks like to contribute to your project. And I found it really helpful to follow your own contribution guidelines. So if you tell people, hey, if you find a bug, open an issue for it. If you want to submit a fix, create a pull request. Do that yourself. Um, it seems kind of silly. This is, this is a pull request I made to myself on my GitHub notifications app. Notice that nobody even commented on it by the time I committed it. Um, I'll usually like open a pull request and then let it sit a day or two and then I'll merge it if, you know, if there's no discussion. 
Um, again, it feels really weird. It feels like you're talking to yourself, but I think it's really helpful for people watching the project to see what it looks like to contribute. It also gives them a, an opportunity to jump into the conversation if they want to. Um, and that's where you have to start trying to invite them in. Uh, again, like it's really hard to get people engaged, um, but there's often these opportunities where you can just say, hey, uh, I see you commented on this thing, I, I, you know, or you created this issue about something that should, should be made better. Would you be interested in submitting a pull request? Um, I'll do that almost, on almost every issue that's open on a project anymore. I'll, I'll ask them if they'd be willing to investigate it. And a lot of times they are. Um, sometimes they're not. But if I hadn't asked, they wouldn't have had that opportunity to participate. We also have to always be hospitable on our projects. And sometimes this gets really hard. Uh, but by the time you see a contribution, the author has usually spent a couple hours either getting familiar with your project or uh, investigating the bug or the issue or figuring out how to build the new feature. Um, and so whether their contribution is something that you want or not, you have to be hospitable to them. You have to be courteous. You know, some of these, some of these, contribu some of these contributors are extremely ambitious, um, but maybe their contribution doesn't quite meet your standards. And so you have to tell them that. You have to give them that feedback. Say, hey, I really liked this. Uh, I usually start out by, by thanking them for their time and their energy. Say, thank you for, give, for working on this. And then I start to give feedback. And, and usually it's in the form of questions. Uh, if I just tell them, hey, this is not good, this is not good, I ask them. Say, hey, could this break in the future? Would, would maybe it make sense to have a test for this? Um, or what do you think about this other thing? Somehow engage them in a way that, that brings them into the conversation even more. When you're patient and courteous with, with contributors, it'll eventually start to snowball. They'll do that to other people that are participating in the conversation, um, and they'll also do that back to you. Now, there's, there's times, too, where even after this feedback cycle, like, things still don't quite meet your standards. Um, and I kind of I liken this to, like, our, every once in a while, our niece will come over and try and help us when, when we're gardening. Um, you know, and she'll like start digging something, and obviously she has no idea what she's doing. She's doing it horribly wrong, but I still need to honor that she's interested in that and that she's, she's putting some amount of effort into it. And so, and the same thing with open source. You know, if, if somebody has, has made their best attempt to try and contribute, sometimes, sometimes you just need to merge it, even though it might not be the same, merge their pull request, and then come back and fix it up later. And then most importantly, with, with this gardening metaphor is you have to give it time. Um, and an open source project is no different. Uh, as soon as you plant the seeds in the ground, it seems like nothing's happening. You'll spend weeks, maybe even a month or more, um, and see no progress. Uh, but as long as you can keep doing it consistently, eventually you'll start to see, to see things grow. So as your, as your project starts to grow, there's actually countless forces that are trying to destroy it. Um, and it's up to you to defend against them. So in gardening, you'll actually take and you'll cover the soil with mulch. So either wood chips or, or grass or something. But the idea is that you're trying to protect the plants and the soil from these forces. So it could be weather, um, it could be weeds, uh, you know, it could be erosion. Uh, so we have, to, we have to figure out how to protect our project. The first thing we need to do is only add features that you want to maintain. Um, and this is probably one of the hardest things with maintaining a project. As soon as you have somebody interested, they'll submit a pull request, and you're like, excellent. And then you realize that it's not something that you're remotely interested in. Um, even though they think it's extremely important, they'll, you know, they might kind of go back and forth with you and say, oh, this is why I think it should be. Uh, if it's not something that you want to maintain, then you simply should not merge it. Um, this has been a, a, probably one of the more painful parts for me in, in open source is you know, somebody will submit uh, a pull request for a mongoid adapter to queue. And it's like, well, that's great, but I don't want to maintain a mongoid adapter because I don't use mongoid. Um, and you don't want me to maintain a mongoid adapter. Tests are extremely important in this process. Uh, as people are submitting contributions, you need to know that the things that they're submitting actually work. Um, and, and so having an existing test suite will, will give an example of how people, um, how people should contribute. 
Uh, not only does it give you confidence, but it also gives confidence to the people submitting these things. Um, so Travis CI uh, is incredible if you haven't used it. Um, I would recommend it on every single open source project. But the great thing is they, submit a, they open up a new pull request, the test will run, and they'll know right away, and you'll know whether their contribution is, is passing or not. And now the hardest part. Don't feed the trolls. <laughs> There's going to be people that will not be happy with your project no matter what. Uh, you may be the nicest person in the world to them, um, and they will still be extremely upset. Try not to engage with them. I mean, say thank you, be, be courteous as you would to any of your other participants, uh, but do not try and aggravate them. TJ earlier was talking about the, the hearts thing. I tried that with one uh, contributor that was not very happy. I kept posting hearts, and eventually I got an email from him that said, just stop posting hearts, I don't love you. I was just like, oh. So I actually went back and took the hearts out, and I think I replaced it with, like, I like you, or something like that, I don't know. He didn't appreciate it, so I learned not to feed the trolls. Um, as your project grows, eventually, though, you're going to mess up some of those things we just talked about. You know, mulching is not enough. Uh, there's going to be weeds that are going to start to grow. There's going to be mistakes that you made. Um, and so we have to prune. Uh, you have to remove features um, that have either kind of gotten unwieldy, gotten out of hand, um, or things that kind of evolved into something that you don't want to actually take care of. So, so remove any of those features that you don't want to maintain that slipped in there. Um, I found it helpful to split them into separate repositories. So like the Q project that I talked about, um, if somebody submits an adapter that I don't want to maintain, I'll just say, oh, well, you can publish it as your own um, and just name it you know, Q-adapter name. Um, and then other people can use it. There's a nice plugin API. Um, but I don't have to worry about maintaining it anymore. One, one recent example of this uh, was on .env. When I, when I started working on .env, the intention the entire time was to have it be development only. Because uh, in production, there's better ways to set environment variables. Uh, but development, it's a pain in the butt. You've got to like, either set them on your machine, and then they conflict with other projects, or figure out some other way to do it. But anyway, over time, people are like, oh, well, here's a Capistrano uh, support for it, so that when I deploy, it'll automatically copy over my config variables. Um, people wanted multiple environments. And it got to the point where I was like, wait a second. This isn't what the project was originally intended for. Uh, so pull request 95 on this uh, repo was the one that split out all of the deployment, all the multiple environment stuff to a separate gem. Now somebody else can maintain that, and people that want that can add it, but I don't have to worry about it being part of the core. So the important part with this, use semantic versioning. Uh, well, first use versioning in general in your app. I'm really excited about the, the Ruby core changes, actually kind of switching to more semantic versioning-ish um, scheme. But so semantic versioning is this idea where each of these the places in this, this number are significant. You have the patch number, um, which is basically bug fixes. Um, you increment that anytime there's a bug fix and only a bug fix. Uh, maybe sometimes like a minor feature, but yeah, mostly bug fixes. Uh, the second one is minor backward compatible functionality. So whenever you add new features to it, you'll bump that. And then finally, the third one is any incompatible API changes. So to show what that might look like, um, if you wanted to remove a feature, you would deprecate it in a minor version and then come back later and remove it in a major version. So the Ruby code for that, say here's one you know, one.x.x of our project. Um, you just simply add a conditional in line. It's like, if you're using this feature, this feature you know, print out a, a warning statement. Um, this, just, you know, this feature will be removed in, in whatever next version. Um, and then also it's helpful if you, if you include caller zero or whatever um, caller line will, will show the, the line of their code that is calling it. That way they know when they see those run in their tests or in continuous integration, they know where it's coming from. As you're doing this, it's really helpful to keep a change log. Uh, so here's the change log from .env. Uh, and basically all it is is it's changelog.md in the repo. Um, and I just highlight major changes that, that people will care about. Um, they could go, I, have, I keep 
a, a link to the full change log that's actually the, the list of commits. But I think it's helpful as, as the maintainer to roll those up um, and highlight, here's the features that you'll actually care about. So then the whole point of all of this is to get a harvest. Uh, and that's not to mean work at harvest, like TJ. Um, no, I'm just, all right, that was lame. It's not as funny as Aaron's joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not as funny as Aaron. Um, no, but the, the whole point of this process is to make your product better, right? It's the main reason we do it. Um, there, there's also the like, you know, altruism, trying to help other people make their product better. Um, but this is, this is the point of doing it. At the point at which it stops producing a harvest, you need to ask yourself some questions. Um, first, does it make sense for me to keep working on this? Uh, I've had a lot of projects over the years that I worked on while I was actively using them, and then at some point I stopped. A uh, delayed job was one of them. I haven't used it in several years, and so it didn't make sense for me to keep working on it. Um, and so give it away when it stops being fun. Find somebody that does care about it and that's willing to take it over. The only caveat to that is don't do that if your product still depends on it. Um, this is something that we've, we've learned the hard way at GitHub. We've given away several projects in the past that we thought we were done with, um, and it turned out our product depended on them. Uh, one example is, is actually the, the project I just got done working on was GitHub Wikis. Um, and Wikis are powered by this library called Gollum which about two years ago, there were some people that were, were submitting some amazing contributions, were really active on it, and so we gave them commit access and release access. Um, they did a bunch of great work. The problem is we didn't keep up with it, um, and two years later now, Gollum itself had evolved to a point where we can't use it anymore. Um, and that's, I mean, that's good. I, I think Gollum's gotten better, um, but we, were not, we did not kind of a whole, uphold our end of that bargain. So. Be careful when you do give it away um, that either the person has your interests in mind or that you, you keep a, a communication channel open with them. You also need to clearly state the project status. If you don't find somebody to hand it off to, then let other people know that it is no longer maintained. Uh, the lesson that we learned this project on was GRIT. Um, GRIT is the library that we use to talk to Git uh, from Ruby. And for, I mean, since the beginning, this has been, to the, to the outside world, the thing we were using. Except that we've been actually working on not using it anymore. We've been working on libgit2 and some bindings to, to these native C libraries. But we didn't tell anybody that. Um, so recently, I submitted a, a pull request to Grit that just updates the change log, um, or excuse me, updates the readme. I don't know if you can read that. But it basically just says, Grit is no longer maintained. Uh, GitHub's working on moving off of it, and you know we're not some, we're not accepting contributions anymore. And then I just went through and closed the like 200 and some open pull requests and issues uh, with a link to that, and said, "Hey, sorry, we're not working on this anymore. Um, if somebody wanted to to pick up a fork of it, they definitely could." So all of these basically come down to us learning from some of our mistakes, um, and this is actually an extremely important part of gardening and maintaining open source. Uh, I think a lot of us are afraid to get into it because you know, maybe our code's not good enough, maybe we're not very good at maintaining these things, uh, but it's all a learning process. Um, and the only way to get better at it is to actually practice it. So earlier this year, I actually tweeted, uh, for the record, I am terrible open source maintainer. Um, and a couple of people like, hit me up on this and they're like, really, like, I've seen you doing a bunch of stuff that doesn't seem consistent. Um, but I think for me personally, like it's, it's, not, it's something I don't feel like I'm good enough at. Um, and so I've been trying to, to work really intentionally at it. But the best part about this is there's not like a world's best gardener. There's not a world's best open source maintainer. Um, you just have to be good enough to, to produce a harvest. You have to be good enough to make your project fit your needs. Um, and so I think that's kind of the redeeming factor in this, that uh, there, there is no perfect. Uh, so, you know, we just need to keep practicing, we need to keep getting better at this. Uh, one favor I ask of you is if you see an abandoned GitHub open source project, please ping me because I want to know. Um, I want to be a better caretaker of that or explicitly say, hey, we're not using this anymore. Thank you very much.